Oh, good in the back? All right. Um, so I guess I'm going to get started. Um, now, this talk is about um, application logic security. And I had to think a little bit when I was coming up with a topic of that talk. Because I think a lot of the times when I go to conferences and I see a security talk and involves PHP, usually it's about the, you know, the usual suspects of cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and so on. So I wanted to talk about something a little bit different. Because while those are still you know, common vulnerabilities, uh, there's still many other issues that a lot of people neglect when it comes to security. Um, and that's really what I want to uh, talk about today. And a lot of them do tie into the actual execution of the code logic or application logic within your programs, frameworks, whatever it is that you may be uh, utilizing. Um, so a uh, quick word about myself. So my name is um, Ilya Alshinetsky. Um, don't try to pronounce the last name. Um, uh, that will not be fun for you and not necessarily fun for me either. Um, so I've been working on PHP for well over a decade now. Um, and for fun, I like to look at things that are security or uh, performance related. Um, and I guess this is one of the reasons I'm talking about security today. Um, and security, it's one of those topics that, you know, you, it's a problem that you can never fully solve. And the moment you think you've solved it, somebody else comes up with a new hack. Um, which to some extent pisses off my coworkers quite a bit because usually I can dig through their code and find something they haven't considered and they have to go in and fix it. But unfortunately for them, they're reporting to me so they can't really complain too much. So um, I guess the one place to start is just to show you a shopping list from the Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP as I like to call it, of the common vulnerabilities that web applications have. This is not a complete list. Uh, but typically, what people talk about is just the first four from that list, which is the cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, uh, code injection, and SQL injection. Why do people talk about them? Well, because they're very common. They're very easy to exploit. Um, and often enough, using Google or some other favorite search engine of choice, you can actually find websites or applications that are vulnerable to one of these just by looking for certain snippets of code. However, they're not the only vulnerabilities you can find. And often enough, uh, when you start uh, getting into things like security audits and so on, the real vulnerabilities are actually issues sitting inside code logic, something that you cannot use an automated scanner, something that you cannot sometimes even have a code reviewer spotted because it's so intrinsic into the nature of how the code and the permission control is being applied inside the application. And often enough, those are the kind of vulnerabilities that remain undetected for a really long time and can be used by people who, you know, let's say, have less than ideal goals uh, to exploit applications and actually make the applications do what they were not designed to do, extract a lot of information from them. So really, though, some of those types of errors is actually what I'm going to be talking about today and hopefully give you some ideas about um, how to protect yourself against it. Um, I'm going to avoid hacking uh, any applications in real time uh, simply because it's all fun and games until you realize somebody in the audience is actually responsible for the site you're hacking. Uh, then it's not so much fun for at least that person. So the pl first place I want to start is actually authentication. And I know there was a great session earlier yesterday um, by Anthony talking about password protection. So I'm going to try to avoid repeating some of what he said. But it is really a good place to start because if you look at most applications, you have that authentication layer where somebody needs to basically move from an unauthenticated user you have no idea about to somebody who has access or certain permissions within the application. Now, the common bit, which hopefully everybody knows, is yes, you should use strong passwords. And that means using all kinds of characters, numbers, and a combination of therein in order to force people to come up with passwords that are not easily guessable. And nowadays, the ideal is, I would say, about eight characters, although many people would recommend using 10 character long passwords, um, which of course would anger most people. I would be pretty annoyed if the application told me a 10 character password because probably I would not be able to remember it and have to use the reset password every other time I log in, uh, which would not be ideal. Um, but really, the main goal behind it is to force people to come up with passwords that are not going to be vulnerable to dictionary attacks. A dictionary attack, just as a general summary, is where you take a list of common words, quickly generate hashes, whether it's uh, MD5 or SHA-1 or even salted hashes if you know the hash and see if in fact that is equal to the password that you're using. 
Um, and the reason for that is to avoid wonderful things like that. And I know probably most of you can't quite see the infographic. This is actually statistics from the LinkedIn password leak, which was, I guess, the most famous one in recent history where LinkedIn decided to open source about 6.4 million passwords of their users. That's unique passwords. Uh, and in about two weeks, uh, close to about 80% of those passwords were actually reversed from the unsalted hashes they were using. And as people found out, uh, roughly 60,000 people use LinkedIn as their password of choice. Um, um, and there's a whole bunch of other winners there, like the word password, link, and so on. And after that, obviously, a lot of people sue. You should have used stronger passwords and so on. But the concept is people uh, want to use things that they can easily remember. And one of the common arguments between people developing applications and, and the actual users is, well, I have a bank card. I only need a, usually a four, uh, you know, four numeric pin, like four digits. And that's all it takes to secure my banking information. So why in the world would I need like an eight character long password with all these strange combination of characters for something that I use to communicate with my friends, right? It doesn't make much sense. Um, so the only difference is when you go to your bank machine and you use your pin, um, you have three tries. And if those three tries fails, your account is locked out. Uh, on most web applications, you can try the same passwords as many times as you want. In fact, you would be limited uh, by your tries simply by how quickly the application can give you, you know, login failed, login failed, login failed. So that's one of the reasons uh, why, you know, in web applications, you sometimes need to even take a stronger standard than something like a bank would use for a bank card or a Visa card um, for their authentication. Now, the, the other issue is that Technology is moving forward, right? So hashes used to take a while to generate, but nowadays, especially in the last couple of years, of this wonderful invention called GPU com computing cluster, which is basically, it's a server full of video cards, which are able to generate passwords really, really quickly, down to the point of SHA-1. How many people here use SHA-1? A few. How many people use MD5? Okay. How many people use stronger hashing algorithms? Okay. So SHA-1, you can generate 63 billion SHA-1 hashes in about a second with a video card cluster. If you're using a uh, stronger algorithm, it's still a fairly insane number, uh, which means most six or seven character long passwords, no matter what you put in them, can be cracked in a matter of hours using that particular cluster. And that's just a single for your rack. And if you need to go faster, you can make two, three, four. And now even Amazon will happily sell you to a computing instance that's based entirely on video cards. So cracking passwords is very, very simple. So one of the first things uh, that you want to do is actually use something that's a little bit less vulnerable to password attacks or rainbow tables, which is basically a large database of pre-generated hashes. Uh, that you can generate. And you, you can do it in PHP using the crypt fun function to which you pass your password of choice. Uh, then uh, you indicate a, a series of parameters. So dollar sign $2y will actually give you a blowfish algorithm. Then the next parameter is actually a very interesting one. And that's effective a cri cryptographic complexity of the data. And what it means is how hard the algorithm should work in order to generate the hash. And the bigger the number, the more complex the algorithm, meaning it takes longer and longer to actually generate this hash. So you won't be able to use a really fast computer or a video card to generate too many of those per second. And the last parameter is some bit of randomness. And one, if you're using a Unix system, one of the best places to get randomness is devurandom, from which in this case, I'm grinding about 32 bytes of data, which is then converted to hexadecimal form. So it can be used inside the function. Uh, and what it does, it generates you a strong password that is not going to be easy to break using an automated routine. And every single password is salted with a different salt, which means even if you're able to crack one password and figure out its salt, it won't really help you with the next password that you need to decode. The only trick is that when you're comparing the passwords, you can no longer really do this reverse routine in a database. Um, you actually need to use the same crypt function, extract that initial portion of the password so that you're passing that parameterization um, to the block and use a crypt function to effectively recrypt the data and see if, in fact, it's going to match the information uh, that you're storing in a database or wherever your password storage is located. Now, fortunately, 
if you're gonna switch to PHP 5.5 at some point, this is made much easier because now you have a um, password hashing API built in right into PHP and you have a password hash function, you pass it the password, you indicate the cryptography algorithm and then you indicate what cost, so what is that algorithmic complexity that you wish to use. And then you have the password verify function that allows you to determine whether or not the password has been supplied by the user during the authentication process. Um, is in fact the valid one or not. Now, what this does is simply ensures that if your password database will leak online, and that has happened to many companies, Yahoo, LinkedIn, um, and there's many, many uh, victims, um, then it's gonna be difficult for somebody to do the quick password recovery job that people did on LinkedIn and get the passwords that are stored in the database. They may be able to get one or two because people used weak password combinations, but they won't be able to get all of the other data. But the interesting thing is how are you gonna handle web brute force attacks where you actually have somebody writing an application that is gonna hammer on your server trying to get in as somebody. And the reason that's a very common attack is in part because a lot of people's passwords are being obtained through holes and other uh, pieces of software that they're using. So what uh, the first step is to see is whether common places like Gmail or Facebook or LinkedIn utilize the exact same password, effectively giving a broad access from one um, security hole to many other applications. But even then, that takes a number of tries. And one of the things that you probably wanna do, no matter how let's say trivial uh, your application is in terms of storing proprietary data is limit the number of sequential password attempts that a user can do before the account requires some sort of additional authentication. For example, Gmail does it and now they do it with a two-factor authentication where they can um, send you an SMS or even make a phone call requiring you to authenticate yourself if you had multiple failed uh, password attempts all at once. Now, if you do encounter multiple uh, attempts, there's a couple of things that you can do. One of this is that if the user still keeps trying to log into the application, you can potentially say that if you keep trying for even longer, we're effectively gonna lock out the account and requiring a human intervention to reactivate uh, the account for any future use, which means it will stop the attack dead in place and not allow it to go any further in the process. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can actually put in CAPTCHA. And if you're using strong CAPTCHA like ReCAPTCHA, for example, which is, at least for now, fairly safe from automated tools, at least that you know that the person on the other end is an actual person, and most people are going to stop after a certain number of attempts. Uh, unless somebody signs up for Amazon's Mechanical Turk and has got a lot of bored people trying to basically break in into the password form. Um, Multi-factor is the other solution, and nowadays you can do it really easily. There are services like Twilio, for example, that will allow you for just a couple of pennies to allow you to send an SMS or even make an automated uh, voice call with a Stephen Hawking voice trying to say something to the user in a variety of languages. Um, and use that information to communicate uh, or ask the user to respond back with some sort of a validation or a security question which would allow them to keep trying or potentially do a password reset. Now, there is email as the other option, but email is becoming kind of a quickly a vulnerable vector because a lot of people's email passwords are actually uh, fairly weak and are subject to attack, and you don't really want somebody's vulnerable email account to become this gaping security hole into every single application they can access because then you simply do a reset password and all the passwords flow into that email account giving somebody full control of the application. Some of the other things that you can do is actually looking at the IP addresses. Now, one of the common things that if any of you have administered a Linux box in recent time, and you happen to be running SSH on the standard port 22, depending on the day, you've probably seen anywhere from 10 to 20, we've seen as high as 100,000 SSH login attempts down to the point that you have SSH actually starting to spike up CPU because people are hammering, trying every single known password combination to log in. Um, now, and one of the best ways to detect it on the system is actually to look at the IP address, because usually the machine that's trying it is a, a, you know, a default CentOS or a Red Hat box with a default set of passwords that got deployed that were never reset, and is now acting and trying to find other CentOS or Red Hat machines suffering from the same uh, problem. Um, but the same can be true for a web application. A lot of people don't log or don't track how many login attempts are actually happening on their page. 
And that means that um, somebody could very easily write a little program that's going to be accessing that page time and time again and trying to get into the system just because you know, they figured out that there's 5, 10, or 30 valid logins and now it's just a matter of figuring out what is a password for those particular accounts. The other thing, and this is more of a little bit of an obfuscation technique, is don't use a standard login and password fields. And the reason for that is because there's at least three different uh, web bots that are kind of acting like unfriendly search engines, if you will, that search for login fields on various applications. And once they find them, they take a good crack at trying to see if the common login and password combinations actually work. So if you use non-standard fields, you can actually give them something to think about and effectively prevent a detection. So it's kind of similar to how you had email scrapers way back then. Now it's the login form scrapers that are going around the web. Um, the other interesting thing is it's a little bit of starting to do pattern analysis. And a lot of the banks are actually starting to implement this technique. And what they do is they say, okay, when you log into an application, there's a certain set of settings that we can detect that seem to be consistent to your behavior. And that could be anything from your browser signature, your, the IP addresses that you're using, maybe even the modules and the versions of JavaScript or the capabilities of the JavaScript that you're using. And by that kind of creating an identity for a certain user. So if you log in from another country or you log in from um, a different browser, for example, immediately it can pop up a re-authentication question even after a successful login simply to confirm it is in fact uh, you who is logging in and not somebody masquerading as you logging in from you know, some place in uh, China or somewhere in you know, northern Africa, which is not where you would normally expect to find yourself in. The other trick, and this is actually a trick that's not just good for authentication, but it's also a kind of an old trick that was used to combat things like screen scraping techniques and so on, um, is actually to have seemingly random field names for all your forms, but at the same time keeping the application largely the same. And the easiest way to implement it is basically for every single user, you would generate a certain secret key, which is based on the output of the OpenSSL uh, random pseudobytes function, which is, I guess, the equivalent of, of using devurandom. And it's a good function to know because OpenSSL is pretty much enabled in every single PHP installation. And if you need some random bytes, it's way better than using srand or rand or any of those functions that you know, don't particularly use a strong seed and can actually be guessed in terms of what's going on. So once you generated this particular secret, every time you need to output form fields, you're actually generating an MD5 or a SHA-1, and you don't need a particularly strong algorithm here of the field name using that secret. So for every single user, the combination of field names is actually going to be different, which makes the content of the form largely unpredictable unless somebody spends the time and effort to do statistical analysis and figure out what is the pattern of fields within the application. Um, and on the processing side, um, all you do is you have a list of your normal um, field names, but you have a pre-processing loop that basically iterates to those fields, checks if the hashed field name is present in the input, and translates it into the field that you normally expect in your application. So you do it as a first step of input processing, and then the rest of the application does not need to worry about the fact that you effectively obfuscated uh, the field names um, inside all of your forms. Um, and what it does, it makes... Yep, question? Yeah, that, that is a correct I mean, point. It worked. Mm -hmm. It stopped all the fake registrations, <laughs> but also a lot of customers complain because they couldn't. Yeah, yeah. autocomplete is, that's, that's a good point because your field names are conti continually changing. Autocomplete is basically going to be made useless because even if you say remember information, every time they access a site, it is going to be creating a new set of information that it remembers. Um, so a lot of the security techniques. Uh, Ultimately, you have to find a balance between security and usability. And that's 
often the two are going to come into conflict in more cases than one. And then you have to determine what is the security level of your application. Are you doing sensitive data processing like payment processing? Are you storing uh, things like social security numbers or various other uh, you know, points of data that are particularly identifying? And maybe you have to split the approach between really sensitive parts of the application and the le less sensitive parts of the application and pick the right approach. But you know, because of all the frequent attacks, at least when it comes to payment processing and the PCI standards, if you have to dealt with them in recent times, they're becoming more and more extreme. And it seems that people writing the standards have the fortune of simply having to write the standard and never having to write an application. So they can come up with whatever creative or whatever difficult technique because they'll never need to implement it. But you know, they do make a point of it because obviously they want to protect the credit card information for whichever um, you know, credit card vendor that they're working with. But generally speaking, if you can compromise an autocomplete, uh, then this technique would certainly make it next to impossible to do screen scraping or automated form filling, especially when it comes to uh, password attacks and so on. Now, um, one of the things that you want to do um, even after the user had logged in, there's still a number of um, things that you need to worry about. And this actually largely comes from having to work with uh, PCI compliance and a lot of the security standards that having to do with either storing government type of information or credit card type of information. First of all, you want to absolutely make sure that your session lengths are strictly enforced. So you don't assume, ah, oh, the browser is going to clear the cookie, but it won't really clear the cookie until you, you know, close the browser window, even if it's a session cookie. It's still going to remain for during that time. So you actually need to have an active expiry process on the server side that's going to make sure that it's going to kick out any of the cookies after you know, 24 or 30 minute period of inactivity. Otherwise, the session still remains active. The other thing you want to do, and this is a very common thing, um, a user does something on the application and they leave and they never come back. Uh, and I, fi I find it particularly amusing. We have, um, I'm, I'm actually from Canada and we have two big computer store chains. One is called Future Shop and the other one called Best Buy. Best Buy, some of you may have heard, it's also big in the US. Uh, Future Shop is more of a Canadian chain. And they have a lot of computers uh, that are open or iPads and people as they're testing, they would go in, log into their mail account, browse their mail, look at how interesting the application is and they'll go and I don't know, look at TVs or leave their store. At the same time, their account is still logged in on that particular computer. And because there's no idle timeout in most of those applications, two hours later, anybody wanting to play with that computer, surprisingly enough, finds themselves inside somebody else's email account. And you start seeing all kinds of interesting messages that they're trying to send, you know, replies all or grab the entire contact list and see what kind of funny message they can send. Um, so one of the ways to avoid that is actually in JavaScript monitor uh, whether or not the user is doing any activity. And after a certain period of an activity, not log out the user automatically, but pop up a little dialog window saying, hey, looks like you haven't been doing anything for the last 10 minutes. Do you want to stay logged in or do, do you want us to kick you out? And you know, a 30 or 45 second timer to let the user make up their mind. Uh, and that's actually one of the things that is uh, being required by um, at least North American governments or the PCI standards that you do kick out the user if they're um, idling too long in an application that has sensitive information. Now, one of the things that you can do is that how do people like Amazon, for example, or larger stores allow you to remain persistently without violating all these rules? So what they actually do is they create two levels of of authentication within the same program. So you have the basic authentication that allows you to maybe view information and kind of use your profile settings and all of that kind of information. But if you choose to change your profile or actually make additional purchases or change something that has to do with payment, you have to re-authenticate into the system. And then you have usually a five or a 10 minute window where you basically have almost like a super user level of access to your account. And you can perform things like, you know, paying for items in your shopping card, you can change your profile settings, but 20 minutes later, you would actually need to re-enter the authentication again. And that allows you to find a balance between um, user convenience um, and security where the user can still appear as being logged in for a long time, but anytime they need to do something sensitive, you need to ask them for additional level of validation. 
So session security, because session security is ultimately one of the places where um, there's gaps um, in many applications and sessions are ultimately the identifier of who the user is as far as your application is concerned, unless you're using some particularly elaborate mechanism that kind of goes beyond uh, sessions. So I'm using a kind of a mostly a setting type and example based on PHP's internal session extension, which is usually found behind many of the frameworks or people just use it directly. But if you're using a custom session implementation, you probably want to take a look at um, setting similar types of protections inside your um, application as well. So the first thing is that you want to make sure that your sessions are using purely cookies. I mean, this is not 97 where a lot of people would have browsers that may not have supported cookies. Pretty much most applications nowadays require you to have a cookie of some sort. You do not want to allow sessions to be passed via post, get, or any other method because it's subject for all kinds of uh, session hijacking and session fixation attempts that can be done. The other thing you want to do is you want to make sure that your session IDs are truly random. And PHP as a whole actually had a, I guess, a common vulnerability for people using the session extension because people figured out that that seemingly random session ID that it generates is actually not all that random. And a lot of the information can actually be predicted down to the point where the value of the session ID is limited to maybe only 30 to 50,000 possibilities, which is not a whole lot for somebody, something that seems to be seemingly unpredictable. Which means if you're able to transmit an enough requests to the server quickly enough, you'll actually be able to predict the user session ID, effectively allowing you to take over some, the next user session or whatnot very easily. So one of the easiest ways to protect it is make sure that you're using a strong randomness to generate that session value. And in PHP, that is as simple as saying entropy file, pointing it to that same dev random I mentioned before, and setting the entropy length to the number of bytes you want to read from dev random. Usually anywhere between 16 to 32 bytes is, is enough to give you a truly random session ID that's not going to be uh, repeated. The other trick you can do is that rather than keeping the um, session string limited to uh, numbers and letters from A to F, you can actually say uh, use bits per character setting this value to six, which will allow almost the entire alphabet as well as some characters like underscore and dash to be used for the session ID value. Uh, the other thing you want to do is set a cookie property uh, called HTTP only. And what it does, it means that all this fun JavaScript is not going to be able to read your session ID. Uh, and that effectively prevents a lot of the session takeover attacks that are involved by using something like XSS uh, to inject a bit of JavaScript into the application and then use the JavaScript to read the cookie that is set on a user and then via an image tag transmit it to any site that they want. They just create a new image tag with a URL to whatever server they want. Um, and last but not least, if you're using SSL, do set your cooking to be, uh, cookies to be secured, and that's a common misconception. If you have an HTTPS site, but you don't actually set this flag on a cookie, the cookie will be stored unencrypted, which means um, there's not going to be any security protection around the cookie data that you're storing, versus with this flag, the information will actually be protected in some way. Uh, the other bit that you want to do is whatever ID that you're using for the actual session, a lot of people you, uh, leave it a default. So you have the common defaults, PHP session ID, uh, you have J session ID uh, session. So pick a name that may be related to your application so it's not a predictable cookie name, even if somebody is able to scrape it out of the cookie stream that it's coming through. And the next thing is that whenever you're initializing a cookie, especially if you're using the session extension, ensure that you call a function called session regenerate ID. And what it does, it effectively recreates um, the ID of the session to make sure it's not an ID that's been fixated by a previous request. So somebody did not pass his ID via URL or even a cookie that they were able to create with JavaScript themselves onto the site. It is in fact an ID that you've generated um, and it's immune from those types of issues. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about is, uh, is data access management. And data access management is kind of a fun little bit where a lot of people um, actually find flaws in their applications if they look long enough. Um, and the reason they find those flaws is because if we look at a typical situation that's called pre-MVC, what you have is a set of different pages or actions 
Each page implements its own access controls in terms of who can access the data, how they can access the data, and so on. And then they go directly to the, the database access layer or whatever the database may be. Which means that if you have four pages, it's not uncommon for you to have four different points of authentication and actually validating of access controls. Which means that there's four places where now you can have a potential security bug and it's very likely at some point at least one of those will be broken allowing um, somebody to get data uh, that they shouldn't have access to. Now, you notice it says pre-MVC, so a lot of people think, oh, if I switch to an MVC framework, all of a sudden this issue goes away because I have my model and everything really happens inside that model. Well, the issue with the model is that the model usually still has different actions defined in the model that the various views are going to trigger from uh, that particular place. And the permissions are still effectively decentralized between the different actions in the model. The only thing that really changed from, MV, uh, from pre-MVC to MVC is the location of where the access controls are found. They're found all in a model, but usually in different places of the model. So you still have that authentication code duplication happening. So ideally, where you want to get to is you want to make access controls be an inherent part, almost like a thin layer inside the model, that any action does not actually control. It almost inherits that information by default from the application, which means all your access controls are centralized in one place, um, and a developer writing a new method does not necessarily need to think about the specific permission controls that need to be implemented within their function. It's done automatically based on the type of user or whatever metadata may be available. So to put this in the context of PHP code, and this is mostly pseudocode, so it's not necessarily a, a running code you can execute, uh, you have a arbitrary data model, and inside the constructor of the data model, you interrogate the data from the user, which namely would be stored in a session or some sort of a global object that references the user. Then based on the type or the nature of the user, you could set additional filters or additional controls that can flow into your query builder or whatever access mechanism that you're using, effectively setting limits on the amount of data that your model is going to retrieve from whatever actions that particular model is going to implement. And what it does, it centralizes all of the permissions uh, within one place. And then later on, you can have a wrapper function that can be executed within, as a, I guess, low level operation uh, within the class before the data goes into a database to effectively apply or enforce these types of permission controls inside the application. But ultimately, what it means, and you can implement it a number of different ways, is that all the access controls really should, should be heavily centralized in the application because the moment you have two places which, where application can determine the access logic, eventually one of them will have a flaw and it will leave a hole in the application. And those types of issues are almost impossible to find because you need to write a whole lot of negative tests to actually find that issue. And the negative tests would not be unit tests, but actually application functional tests. So you'll need to use something like Selenium or Cucumber to actually emulate a user's path through the application. So not something you want to deal with if you don't have to. So audit trails. Um, audit trails um, is one of the key things that any application um, that deals with things that are sensitive to security or just in general, you want to maintain the record of what's happening to the data should actually maintain. Um, and it has a lot of positive security connotations because an audit trail will tell you who did the action, uh, when they did the action, what did they change. It may not tell you why they did the action, but at least if you have the trace log, you could potentially revert their action. You can do pattern analysis and common actions to identify things that are, let's say, unusual and potentially may be indicative of somebody breaking into the application and all kinds of um, useful things like that uh, you can do with this information. So security is one of the reasons why you would do audit trails. Um, there's also, you know, for debugging it's very helpful because often enough you're trying to debug an application and you have no idea how the user got to that particular error, even if you have a backtrace because it's possibly that the state uh, that fed a lot of the information to the application had actually some data from previous operations they have performed and that ultimately what had led to the particular failure that was encountered. And the other bit is it allows you to do um, more of the unusual security practice, which is effectively search for pattern analysis. So if you were in Andre's talk earlier today when he talked about machine learning, one of the really great applications for machine learning is actually to do 
pattern analysis on log files or audit trails from the performance of the application to identify unusual patterns. Like most of our users don't try to, um, you know, take items in and out of shopping carts a hundred thousand times within the period of a day. That's not a usual behavior. Or the way they go through application is largely the same. So if you have a set of users who start breaking the pattern, that is a potential indication that it's somebody who's trying to do that exploratory research to find some sort of a vulnerability in the application. And that allows you to stop them at least or block their access to the application, even though you don't quite know what it is that they're looking for. And sometimes you have to go on that. If you see somebody doing something unusual, it's better off to block them rather than to wait until they actually find something because you may not be able to detect it at that point. Um, and the last bit is Audit Trail also gives you ability to revert undesired activities. And the undesired activities could be something resulting from a hack or it could be simply the result of a code that did not work properly. So it has that very useful operation, I guess, as well. Now, when it comes to implementing um, audit trails, uh, one of the best ways is you do not want to leave it up to the application layer to actually capture the model. So just like the access controls, it's something that you want to put deep inside the model, something that's going to be largely automatic, and it's not something that's going to require a developer to think or worry about, am I going to be writing into a log or not? It's something that's done automatically every single time. The other thing you want to, uh, the other way to implement it, and this is probably a way to do it if you have a really good DBA, uh, is actually to do it not even inside your PHP code, but actually do it right inside your database layer. Most databases today support triggers, which is basically procedures that you can execute when there is an update or an insert operation. And you can tell the trigger to compare the previous and the current data and write the differential into a separate table, effectively giving you an audit trail. The only difficulty with that is database normally does not know um, that who is the user performing the particular action. So you would need to effectively inject that information into the query still via the model or some sort of a common database wrapper which you may be using to feed that information in, which is why it's largely a uncommon techniques for doing audit trails, but certainly one of the more powerful ones because even if somebody went into the database and started making changes, the triggers would be able to record the operations that they're doing. And that's helpful if somebody does find a SQL injection inside your code and is able to inject some sort of a write operation, you would actually have a trail of that operation versus if you relied entirely on PHP, you would have no, no way of knowing that some unpredictable or undesired piece of SQL code was actually uh, created. So if you do choose uh, to uh, do uh, PHP audit trails, uh, one of the ways you can do it is via something like this save method that I have here, where the first thing it would do is it would retrieve the current record as it's currently represented in a database or wherever you're storing it today, and then compare the difference of the data that you're trying to change to that record using the array diffasoc function, effectively giving you an array containing only the values that have changed during that particular operation. So that's effectively the um, change set between the current state and where the current operation wants to try to get you to. And then aside from that, you would log the ID of the user, um, you know, current time, uh, which operation or which class or even which model captured this information. Um, you know, the record that was being modified, because usually every one of your records would have some sort of a unique identifier, and ultimately the data itself. Uh, now in this case, I'm using the serialize function, which is just a quick way of converting it from an array to a string. If you are going to actually implement it, I would suggest using IG binary uh, serialize because it will give you a much more compact form. So it will take less space than the native PHP serialization routine. Um, and it's kind of a good practice to have. And the other thing that's very important is wherever you're going to be logging your files, you want to make sure that your logs are tied to the actual transaction itself which means that if you're going to be doing an insert and update, you're not going to commit that insert and update up, and up until the log files have been written because you don't want some sort of an interruption, predictable or unpredictable, leaving you with a state where a database was changed but there was no audit trail captured along with that information. So effectively, unless the audit trail was written successfully to database disk, your uh, you know, Redis or memcache instance, you're not actually going to commit the query until you're sure of that success. Because if you don't, then you create a possibility of certain operations being uh, aborted. And one of the ways that users can influence that is there is a 
a Unix signal called SIGPIPE. And you can actually trigger that um, uh, signal if you abort a TCP connection in certain ways. Um, which you can actually trigger from the outside. And many applications would use it, okay, that means the application had stopped, effectively giving the user ability to abort something halfway through. And if it, they time it just right, they can leave you without, with basically without any audit trails if you haven't uh, used a transactional approach. So unusual pattern analysis uh, is one of the things that you can do uh, both automatically and manually. So larger companies actually have whole teams that all they do is they look at audit trails or look at log files and try to figure out is there anything unusual uh, that's happening in that process. And unusual can have many different definitions. It's not the same for everybody. Um, and it ultimately depends on, okay, what is 80 or 90% of my users are typically doing? And everybody who's doing something other than that um, is potentially suspect behavior. So it's a little bit kind of like racial profiling, if you will, but inside your application. Um, and that's one of the really only ways that you can detect um, bugs that you don't know about. Because one of the best vulnerabilities is the one that nobody knows about. Once it's published, even if it's a zero day, it's known. Once it's known, it's usually a you know, the clock is ticking to having that issue resolved. But if nobody publishes the vulnerability, they could keep using it for, you know, years and years and years. And, and that's potentially the most dangerous vulnerability that there is. And the only way you can spot that somebody maybe got a hold of that vulnerability or is in the process of searching for it is to look for things that are out of the ordinary. And for many web applications, it could be the number of accesses, the time of accesses, the locale of accesses. If most of your user base is located in a particular country, when somebody on a different continent uh, late at night starts accessing your application, that's probably not a typical behavior. And that is potentially indicative of something that could be a an attack or it could be something that's going on. And a lot of the time, common approach to breaking applications a trial and error process. And what it means is that you're going to have a lot of things that are happening time and time again because they begin trying different combination of parameters, different combinations of flows, and that's usually something that is very easily detectable uh, through the process of doing, let's say, unusual behavior analysis or if you don't want to do it manually, machine learning is a great reason to, um, you know, great solution to that particular problem if you don't want to kind of do it every single time. Now, um, what do you do with that unusual behavior is, um, you know, something that you have to look, uh, you know, depending on a situation. And just because there is unusual behavior doesn't mean anything uh, is wrong because some people like to do things differently and that's perfectly fine, but it's a matter of, is there a pattern to a certain activity? Is there something that's consistent and is something that's happening um, you know, every single time? And usually the patterns are one of the three, as I mentioned before. A large number of access in a short period of time, um, you know, loc locale, different IPs or different countries that are being accessed. If you have the same account being accessed in parallel or in sequence from multiple different locations, from multiple different addresses, um, that's uh, one of the issues that you may encounter. Basically, anything unusual that you don't expect is something to look for. Now, um, the other thing you want to take a look at is you don't, you know, for best security practices, it's not enough to just validate your input. Because validation of input allows you to protect yourself against, uh, let's say, external uh, attacks where people are injecting the input. But it's also equally important to actually validate input of your own application down to the low level, meaning the model. Because often enough, what you may find is that by triggering an error or unexpected input, you can actually get the low level model to perform an undesired operation within the application. For example, if you get some function to return false, meaning an error as, a, as opposed to a desired value, and it get passed to a function, false will get translated to integer of zero, or in some cases an empty string, and potentially allow a query to retrieve data that should not be able to retrieve, or otherwise not implement a certain filter or a certain limit within the application. So one of the things that, if, you know, for a good security practice you want to maintain is that not only do you not want to trust the user, you don't really want to trust your own application either because your own application could be made to do things that you don't necessarily want or you don't necessarily expect. Um, and 
fortunately, in PHP, you can do that with the same mechanism that you actually use to uh, validate a user input, which is the filter extension. So uh, for every mechanism that gets um, parameters, you can actually define a configuration array which defines what is the type of the parameter, what are the flags, am I expecting a scalar value or am I expecting to be a, uh, to a mixed value. You can even implement regular, based, uh, regular expression based filters and there's a lot of built in filters like for email, IP addresses and so on. And then whenever the data is coming into the model, the very first thing you would do is you would actually run it against a set of filters to ensure that the data that came in from your application is in fact the type of information that your model wants to consume. And that kind of gives you an extra level of protection um, against not necessarily an undesired input getting in, but an input, undesired input getting in is getting filtered in some way or trigger an undesired behavior of the function, and that is then being used to uh, trigger a vulnerability inside the application. It's kind of a you know, two-way approach to finding security vulnerabilities. And because of the filter extension, as you hopefully can see from this example, it's really just a single function call away. You give it your configuration, the input data, and you get back an array which only contains the valid information. Or if there's any issues, you, um, you can trigger an error and exit out of the application or do whatever error handling logic you wish to apply. Um, the other um, security vector uh, to consider is remote URL access because nowadays, I wouldn't say all, but many applications depend on third-party uh, data sources, uh, whether, you know, in some sort of data feeds, whether it's SOAP or REST or, or whatever other remote source from which you're retrieving the information. Uh, and ultimately that information is flowing a, over HTTP. And the common mistake people make is they think, oh, if it's going over HTTPS, I can just happily use file get contents and everything is going to be fine. Uh, forgetting one little issue that uh, you, you have something called DNS hijacking, where you can make your server think that you know, Google.com is actually a server somewhere in southern China, at which point you're retrieving data from God knows whom, and the data contains you know, God knows what, so to speak. Um, so whenever you're dealing with API-based URLs, I don't think, I haven't seen too many FTP-based URLs recently, it's mostly over HTTP now, um, then you want to make sure that you're validating that the SSL certificate that is being used for the connection is in fact valid and is matching the domain uh, that you're trying to access. Uh, you probably want to avoid things like um, simple XML load file or file get contents to which you simply pass the entire URL and get either a parsed XML string or a string of data that you're actually going to uh, use, ideally you would want to use kind of a modified file get contents or ideally through a curl where you actually implement additional security controls specifically around SSL. Uh, specifically what you want to do is you want to verify peer to kind of validate the, um, the server on the other side. You want to make sure that the certificates actually match the root certificates, which usually are installed on most Linux distros, but if they're not, you can download them from our curl website using the w command, uh, wget command that is embedded inside a comment. You also want to go to a sufficient depth, so you're not just going to validate the certificate itself. If it's a chain certificate, meaning it depends on another certificate for validity, you actually are going to go through the entire chain to ensure that's valid. And finally, you want to make sure that the domain inside the certificate matches exactly to the domain that you're trying to access so you are not redirected somewhere where you did not expect. And by doing all these checks, you're actually ensuring that the server that you're talking to is in fact the server that you intended to talk to. And it's not somebody else masquerading as that server because they intercepted the TCP stream or they were able to do some DNS hijacking and make the domain appear from coming somewhere else. So as you can see, doing it straight in PHP using the options or the context of the stream is a little bit complicated. So fortunately, if you use curl, you can actually do it very easily because curl implements a lot of those checks by default. So unless you physically turn them off yourself, which a lot of people do. In fact, um, there was a payment gateway called Moneris, which is fairly big in North America at least, and they wrote a PHP class to interface with uh, their gateway over HTTPS, and inside curl, they effectively turned off verify peer and verify host. So as the moment you were able to uh, fake the DNS entries for Moneris, you would be sending credit card information of your customers to whoever managed to perpetrate this particular attack. 
And it took them about six months to actually adjust their libraries. And all they had to do was comment out the two lines they put into their code um, to say, don't verify SSL. And when asked why did they even do it in the first place, well, a lot of people didn't have the right certificates set up on their servers or whatnot. So to avoid getting a PHP warning about certificates not matching from a CRL library, we just turned it off so it kind of flows without any errors. It was not a particularly good thing. Uh, but, you know, so convenience and security sometimes do come into conflict. Um, in those type of cases, you probably have to err on the side of security. So the two options that you probably want to grab through your code to make sure you're not accidentally turning off is a curl opt SSL verified peer and curl opt SSL verify host. Chances are if you have those options, you should probably go in and uncomment those lines because that means you're effectively saying, ah, security, I don't need it. Let's just you know, get to making connections and hope for the best. So PHP error handling, uh, where would be a, a PHP security talk with at least spending a few minutes talking about um, errors inside PHP. Now, um, the common perception is that you know errors happen and they're not you know a particularly uh, you know dangerous thing, but um, you know it is a very false uh, misconception. So the first thing you want to do is you want to log all your errors because errors are the sign of something going wrong, and usually if you want to fix something having that error trace and error information is the first step to resolving it. And usually when somebody's trying to break something, eventually they'll start generating certain errors. And they're starting generating certain errors. Hopefully you go and look at that particular code and maybe identify a flaw in that code before somebody from the outside is able to derive it from the different error messages that they're getting inside the application. Now, the common mistake people make is, uh, is actually with logging of errors. Uh, I've seen at least a dozen applications where the primary database is MySQL where they store the information and that is also a convenient place to store errors which means things where you cannot connect to a database or a database connection is dead ultimately will not get logged anywhere because there's no database to log the information to. Uh, which is why one of the better approaches to logging is to actually log things to disk or to syslog where, and then later accumulate the data if you have multiple machines into a central monitoring place because both of those mechanisms are not going to have any external dependencies, meaning that you can rely on them always being available, unless of course you run out of disk space, but you probably would have other problems if that happens. Um, and uh, later on do analysis on a separate machine. And that's really crucial because that's a very common mistake to make because it's a very easy mistake to make. I have a database, I have my MongoDB connection, I have my memcache connection. Well, why can't I store my errors there? I already know how to talk to that particular instance. It's just a simple, right? But again, simple and um, you know, security uh, does not really work well together. And then there is a common belief there are trivial errors. And trivial errors are e-notices, e-deprecated, e-strict, and all those uh, fun kind of things. And this is where I like to bring up the Google search result page for warnings. Uh, e-notices gives even more results, which basically finds you, I think it's about um, 5.6 million websites where you can actually see some information about their application. Uh, at, at the very minimum, you'll be able to see their file structure. And then most, uh, and many databases at least, um, or database drivers in PHP in older versions, also very convenient that if you fail to connect to, let's say, MySQL, and you happen to be using password for authentication because you're passing the parameter to the MySQL connect function, PHP will happily emit it to the screen to let you know which password you failed to connect with. Now, the connect, the you know, the connection failure could have been because your site was slash dotted or somebody sent too many requests and it's actually, you know, relatively easy to trigger from the outside um, and a password is now, um, you know, something that somebody could try to do to initiate an external connection to your system. So at the very minimum, you want to set the display errors to uh, false or to zero so they're not emitted to the screen so that you're not part of this, uh, let's call it Google wall of shame for PHP websites, if you will. Um, and that's a common thing. I mean, there's very clever, uh, there's actually a couple of websites where people come up with all kinds of very clever um, Google search strings that allow you to find different types of errors. Everything from SSL authentication errors to uh, file get contents errors, which tells them which URLs people are frequently trying to access to database connection errors. So basically you can find whatever type of vulnerability you think or whatever type of error you think you have a vulnerability for. 
And all it takes is some clever Google or Bing or Yahoo searches for that matter. Um, so that's uh, kind of a quick dash through kind of general level security topics that I had for you guys today. I would love to hear your feedback on this URL below. Uh, and I'm going to try to post these slides at the same URL probably in the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes after the talk is over. Um, so I think we have about eight minutes left. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them.